Welcome back, listeners, to this episode of Shapes of Grief. This week, I'm joined all the way from North Carolina by Tasha Smith. Tasha, you're really, really welcome. Thank you so much, Liz, for having me. Um, Tasha has recently published a book called Can You Just Sit With Me? And I absolutely love this title. It says so much about the needs of the bereaved, but also says so much about you, Tasha. Um, and this request of people, when we say, what do we say? What do we do? I don't want to get it wrong. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I make them sad? What if they cry? Can you just sit with me? Mm -hmm. It's the silent cry of so many bereaved people. Just be alongside me. Tasha, we've spoken briefly about your history and I'm so moved already by what you've been through and the enormity and the amount of losses that you've experienced already in your life. Um, and we need to go back nearly 30 years to your first experience of profound loss. Could we start with the teenage years and what happened to you there, Natasha? Yes. So um, during those teenage years, it started with a teen pregnancy, um, a teen pregnancy, which ended in a miscarriage. And then a couple of years later, another teen pregnancy, which resulted in um, placing my baby um, for adoption, which is another loss. And so those years was very um, included, like, just a grieving in silence because there was so much guilt and shame associated with those losses. And I kind of talk about that some in um, a chapter in the book called Invisible Grief. And it's a, it's a chapter just kind of discussing disenfranchised grief, those, those losses that are deemed unworthy to be grieved. And that's how I felt during those years. Um, that the losses that I experienced weren't worthy to be grieved because society or culture deemed it, well, it's your fault, you know? And yeah. so um, I kind of, I kept those losses to myself, literally. You said you grew up in a very Christian household. I know all about that. Um, being here in Ireland, could you talk a little bit about what it meant to be pregnant as a teen in a Christian household and how that impacted the experience for you? Yes, um, thanks so much for that question because that really shaped um, how I grieved, you know, moving forward from these losses. Um, but growing up in a Christian household, um, pregnancy and sex before marriage was, that's that's not a thing, like you do not do that. <laughs> And so um, it was deemed sinful and it was frowned upon and it was just, you know, just, um, it was just something that was not encouraged. And so I knew based on what I've seen, even in my older sister, like I had an older sister where she had a teen pregnancy, I've, se I've seen how the culture or even the church, you know, kind of um, frowned upon it so bad, you know, it was just such a huge or bad experience for her. And I just knew I was like, oh my gosh, I know this is going to happen to me too, as far as like how the, she was treated, even by the church, it was horrible. And so um, I was like, no, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody this. I'm not going to tell anybody I'm hurting. I did not have a safe place to share. I did not have a safe place to, to process. And I didn't know what was going on, you know, as a young teen girl. And did so it was share, scary. Did you share with anyone that you were pregnant or that you had lost your pregnancy? My sisters. And that was my sisters and maybe my best friend. Like they, they knew. Mm. So and then I think later on my dad, but I could never tell my mom. So real disenfranchised grief. Yeah. And do you remember, like, I assume at 15, you didn't really have the language to know this is disenfranchised grief. 
this is a loss I'm experiencing. Even though I don't want to be pregnant, it's still devastating that I've lost my baby. And all these paradoxes, I can only imagine the confusion. Yes, absolutely. 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 Um, I didn't have the language. That's the perfect way to put it. And kind of, um, you know, doing the research for the book, like I am literally walking through this, uh, this processing and therapy of my own, because I'm doing so much of this research. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's what was going on with me, you know? Yeah. But yeah, those years ago, I had no idea. I was so confused and yeah, it was a lot. So a couple of years later, you were pregnant again and you, the the baby survived and you yeah. gave birth to to a little child that you then put up for adoption. Mm -hmm. And this is another field of disenfranchised grief that's hugely painful for both parents and adoptees. Um, I know a little bit about this because my brother's a genetic genealogist who helps people find their, oh. their biological parents, but rarely is it the dream they've spent their lives. Right. I think it will be. Um, what's your experience, Tasha? Mm -hmm. um, this, again, so, so tender to talk, to talk about, but it's, um, again, it's an invisible grief. Like if you saw me, people, who, you know, they would never imagine that I carry this daily, even now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And how many assumptions we make about people. Oh, she's so strong or she's written a yeah. book. She's an author. Look at her. She's got four kids. She got over that. Yes. Actually, it, none of that means anything. Right. Are you mm -hmm. willing to share what it is like for you? to be the mother of a child who was given up for adoption? Sure, yeah. Um, I know even, so every single day, I pray over my children who are with me. And I pray over my child who's not. So every single day, I'm thinking of him, mm -hmm. a, baby, a baby boy who is now an adult <laughs> and probably has, you know, I don't know. He could be married, has kids. I don't know, you know. Um. And so it's it's a daily thing that I think of that probably no one knows that I'd think of, mm. you know, so, um, yeah. And how did you grieve him or did you, was there even space for that or to survive? Did you have to just suppress that grief? Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, absolutely. Suppress that grief absolutely um try to stuff that one down and try to forget and 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 I probably did a pretty good job of it at the beginning you know because um busyness was my go-to thing like I stayed busy um just trying to escape the grief and I really feel like you know in in writing the book it's been such a, uh, just a process from a, a standpoint of like, did that really happen? Yeah, that really happened, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And literally after writing the book, I started seeing a counselor. It was so much, it was too much <laughs> to process. Like yeah. everything came to the surface and I processed, I was processing as I was writing and the research was so, so, so helpful and healing. Um, but it's still a lot that was so suppressed and pushed down. Well, the whole emotional aspect of it, right? Yeah. It's yeah. really interesting that you say when you were writing the book, mm -hmm. you were questioning, did that really happen? Is that, yeah. really, you know, that's very much a feeling that we can have in the aftermath of someone's death. God, do they really die? Is that true? Is this real? And we, we know it has happened, but it takes such a long time for our, at a cellular level and yeah. a neurological level to fully accept and believe and accept that this is real. 
when I say accept, I don't mean to be okay with it. No, I know. Just mean yeah. going, yep, yeah, that definitely happened. They died. I went through that. And it's almost like that can't happen unless we're experiencing the loss. We need mm -hmm. to experience the loss and feel it and then get on with our day, experience the loss and get on with our day. And it's that oscillation, you know, what we call the dual process model. It's that oscillation between loss orientation and restoration orientation, which actually helps us to process and integrate and come to a point of that happened, that's real. I accept this is true now. But if we don't have that grieving process because it's been suppressed, what I'm hearing from you is it's your experience, even decades later, still felt surreal and dreamlike. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, definitely. Would you say more about that? Mm -hmm. I think it's um, a way to, it was a way of coping from a standpoint of, um, suppressing it for so long and saying, you know, did, did this really happen? Because even in my, in the high school years, um, pretty much no one knew about the first, the, the miscarriage because it was, you know, it wasn't like, you know, um, visibly, you know, one could visibly tell because it was early on, but for the, you know, full term baby, you know, um, you can visibly see. And so I had to, con I lied so much. Like people were asking, I hid and dodged everyone that, you know, knew me. Like I, I literally like lived like a hermit for a few months at my, camped out at my sister's house until the baby was delivered. Um, and so it was, you know, as a couple, I, I just wanted to, to forget that part of my life. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so, um, and so now, you know, decades later, when I think about it and have been able to process it, it's, it's, it's those like, you know, did that happen? And then some days like, wow, you know, I have like a, an adult child somewhere. Yeah. And I'm so sorry that happened to you. It's brutal how we treat women. Um, it's absolutely brutal. Yeah, it's there's so many similar stories here in Ireland. And I was 33, well, 32 when I first got pregnant and I wasn't married, but I, I was with a, my long term partner. Um, but even telling my mother, I was dreading it yeah. you know, um, because I grew up in a very Catholic family as well. And I remember like being in the kitchen of their house. And Madonna's song, Papa, don't preach, you know, going through the <laughs> song. As, and, uh, and my partner at the time sort of dying because he could get the message from me in the song. But he was as uncomfortable as I was coming to tell my parents news that I was delighted about. <laughs> I had no doubts I wanted to be a mother. I It was no surprise. It was an intentional and much longed for pregnancy but still that piece of telling the very religious parents was hard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to go through that as a young girl, a new teen, a young teenager and having to hide out, it's just so wrong. And I'm sorry that happened to you. Thank you. Yeah. So fast forward a few years, you have these, you've had these two immense losses both have been suppressed. There's been no space for grief. You've mentioned other emotions such as shame and guilt. Um, this wasn't the end oh, of loss yeah. for you. Right. Yeah. So um, I graduate high school. I leave for college. And my sophomore year, my oldest sister dies. Um, she dies of cancer and she's 32. Wow. Hmm. And so that really shook me. Um, and then uh, um, kind of to add to that loss, um, because I was away at school, my family um, knew that the doctor had gave given her a 
you know, kind of a limited time to live, but they, uh, she didn't want me to know. So they didn't tell me. So it was a total shock to me, but it wasn't a shock to them. What was that like for you, Tasha, not knowing? Was that the right thing for you? No, it was not. It was totally devastating. And it it literally and honestly took years to, I don't want to say get over, but to move through. The fact that with, you were told. Yes, with forgiving my family. <laughs> Were they trying to protect you? They were. And I know that, but it, I know, you know, as an adult now, I know that it was a protection. Um, I know that, but it, it hurt. It still hurt. <laughs> Absolutely. We And I think we do that. We don't talk about grief or dying or illness. Yeah. We want to upset other people. But right. actually the harm... The harm. the harm of keeping information away from people is far greater a hurt yes yeah could you speak a little bit more about that Tasha about what it felt like to have been excluded from that information what did that deprive you of yeah so um a lot of my family was able to have like their final goodbyes so to speak with her and I didn't get that opportunity. So that's, you know, that kind of adds to the grief because it's the, you know, the loss of not being able to say goodbye or to spend that time with her um, in her last weeks or days. So you were never told that she was dying. You just learned that she had died. Right. So I wanted, so she passed, she died in um, November of that year um, in 98. And the last time I had kind of met, I met with my sisters was at like another family's, um, we had an aunt to, to, that passed away. And so we had attended the funeral and then we had came back to get something to eat. Just me and my sisters is four girls. And, um, and we were just sitting eating, excuse me, <clears throat> we were sitting and eating and um and she had mentioned that she had cancer and i didn't know because i was so young <laughs> like a teenager i'm like oh okay you know i'm thinking it's like not a cold but you know something that is treatable because at that time you know na naive you know just thinking medicine cure you know we do we get something the doctors can do something and heal it so um, if you haven't been through that with someone, you don't know what to look out for. You don't know what questions to ask. Right. So you, you don't know until you've lived it. Yeah. Many things. Yeah, so true. And so I didn't know. And so, you know, just in conversation, she tells tells me this and um, I can tell my other sisters no. And so she's telling me and, and I'm like, OK, you know, well, you know, well, I love you and I don't know what I would do if something happened to you and I totally remember saying this because I almost associate that with maybe her decision to say well don't let her know what the daughter said yeah because you know so um but I'm not sure but yeah so that was the last time that I had spoken with her from a standpoint of like you know I have cancer but then obviously it progressed and but I didn't know any of those details and it's, you know, the, this is a subject that's come up before, Tasha, with other people. You know, we, we, like I say, we try to protect people by keeping information away from them. Mm -hmm. But what a deprivation, you know, you've talked about, you would have liked to have spent time with her, said thank yous. I, I don't yeah. think you say goodbye to people. Yeah. But you say things like, thank you. I love you. I right, love absolutely. You. And and maybe we we create some more memories with them yeah. while they're unwell. And when we don't tell people the seriousness of our illness or somebody's illness, we're depriving them of really precious moments. Mm -hmm. Were you angry? Oh my gosh, yes. I was so angry. I was so angry for a little while. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about your suppressed grief from your two pregnancies. Did that come up when your sister died? 
I mean, great, great. We don't have separate, like cows yeah. have different stomachs, don't they? <laughs> for when they're eating, it's like, we don't have separate grief pools. This one is for I my know. sister. This is, you know, it's just there in us. It's, it's an energy. But yeah. sometimes when we experience a loss, the, 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 the feelings that just come with it are so profound because sometimes it takes a new loss to give us permission to grieve an ungrieved loss, for example. Mm -hmm. I can't say like with all certainty that it, it did, um, but I can imagine that it did um, just from a standpoint of this is a grief that, or this is a loss that it's okay to grieve culturally speaking, you know, so I can, you know, I could, I can totally, would totally get that emotions that were coming out during that time were still some of those suppressed emotions from the previous losses, because this is a time where, you know, others around me, they're grieving because my sister died, you know, and it's, it's almost like, okay, everybody has permission to grieve now. So, yeah. Yeah, and such a such a valid point. This is not your first big loss. It's your third big loss, mm -hmm. but it's the first one that is allowed to have a public face. Right. Yep. Yeah. And it doesn't end there either. Mm -mm. Hmm. What happened next? Yeah. Um so I have the loss of my sister, my next oldest sister. Um, and this was a heavy blow because, you know, she called and told me she has cancer, but it was a treatable, like super simple treatable. But she was, she died in three weeks from that diagnosis. Or was it three months? It might be three weeks. I feel like it was three. It was super fast. Mm -hmm. It was super, super quick. And did you do anything differently by having those three weeks? How did having the information impact the anticipation of her dying and then her death? Yeah. I want to say I want to kind of correct that. I think it was three months, but um, but yeah, the sure. it was totally yeah, it was totally different than um, those years previous. Um, like we basically lived at the hospital. Yeah, yeah. We basically camped out, and um, even in the last weeks, my niece, my niece, which is um, that was it's, it was her mom. We took turns because at the time I was working like a regular nine to five in corporate America. And so we took turns um, each night after work, like we would pair off and sit with her. And then I literally, like when I was there, just read scriptures over her, prayed, pray for, um, and she was kind of in and out. So, but it was still, time that I was able to spend with her hmm. and create new memories and you told me Tasha before we started recording that you start you know it was really when COVID hit yeah and the world started talking about loss and grief that you realized you'd been sitting in a field of grief much of it unexpressed for decades Mm -hmm. And that's when you started writing your book. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for that question. I, 2020 was uh, just a crazy time in our world. Um, and literally, as I had began to earlier that year, I'll start with the beginning, like around March timeframe before we got the um I guess the announcement from who, you know, um, my best friend and I had went to a football game with our husband or a basketball game with our husbands. And, you know, we had no clue, like literally that week we were going to be declared in a pandemic. And so the world just 
took a a fast quick turn into um what we know now you know it's the 2020 in our COVID time frame but the world just seems so dark everywhere you turn you know you turn on tv the news or in conversation with others we're talking about death like and not just a few lives lost i mean it was massive you know so i mean you literally turn on tv and you see people carting bodies in trucks and Mm -hmm. you you hear of people not being able to see their loved ones who um had died or being able to carry on with their normal rituals of death I'm like oh my gosh like I started I was feeling it like I at that time I hadn't lost anyone to COVID or anything but I was feeling it like personally like it feels like I've lost these people that I see on TV you know and so I was like okay and then on top of that in our country there was a political season going on and there was (laughs) racial there were uh racial tensions it was a a few um uh racial violence and people that died because of um police violence and and so it was a lot of riots going on I mean it was like just crazy in our culture George Floyd's really the whole movement well it did the movement was there already it was it just became so much more visible to so many more people because that happened to be recorded Right. Whereas that's happening all the time, every day, everywhere, and has Mm -hmm. been for years, for decades. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that on top of, you know, everything else, pandemic, political, racial violence, I'm like, oh my gosh, how I'm feeling right now is how the world, how the world is looking around me, like this death, this grief, all this loss is how I've been feeling on the inside for all these years. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I had, uh, I was supporting someone whose child was very ill at that time. They were, the, the their little child was in hospital with incurable cancer. And I do remember, and she wasn't the only person who said this to me, several people did. It's like the rest of the world has joined us, oh, you know, because yeah. that's where, that's the zone that people were dwelling in emotionally for so long if they were going through loss or anticipating loss or, um, you know, just at the other side, well, there isn't really another side, but at the other side of a, a profound loss and grieving, it's this, this zone that normally doesn't resonate with the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. But for those months, even those years, it's like the world caught up a little bit. There was a little bit of evening yeah. out. That's so true. So just we mentioned George Floyd there, and I know this isn't the first time we've spoken about him here on this podcast. And, you know, if we could talk about race and loss as well, because we know it's a fact that black people experience a disproportionate amount of loss compared to white people or Asian people. What's your experience or your knowledge of that, Tasha, having researched your book or even just from your own experience? Mm -hmm. So a little um, from my own experience, as well as my continued research, because I have a new book that I'm currently writing um, that will be more specific to um, Black women grief. And so, um, but yeah, definitely is the numbers are disproportionate to the amount of loss and grief in um, in the black black and brown communities and it's even stemming from all the way back to slavery you know and so it's it's disconcerting and um it's been hard to read the research it's been hard to um to live it out as well and from a standpoint of you know the questions of why is it so different you know and and it will it change and has it changed and what we see you know what we've seen from 2020 when you know things were really like eyes on everything um because it has been happening along you know it has it's been happening for so long um that you know 
I think the black community, you know, is is how do you live well in this grief filled world that doesn't seem like there will be a reprieve in this type of loss and grief? Not anytime soon, anyway. Right. Yeah. It's like there's oh, it's the the awareness is spreading slowly, but is there willingness to change? Exactly. You know, it's like um. Oh, one of my favorite quotes of all time, and I don't know who it's by, but it's when you're used to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Mm. Wow. And I just I that that quote feels so really resonates with me in so many ways. But it's like those of us who are so privileged because of our socioeconomic status or our gender or the color of our skin. Um, it's almost like we feel we'll lose, you know, mm -hmm. rather than no, everybody yeah. can actually be treated with love and respect and equality without you losing anything, mm -hmm. you know, but it's like that awareness is going to take so much longer to really become general knowledge. Yeah. And I can only imagine the frustration and the injustice. Yeah of that I do have a um a chapter in the book that kind of talks about um like our world and it kind of stems from the 2020 um 2020 and then you know what was going on racially at that point to kind of bring out or just make aware even more like what um the black community was already going through before 2020 hit and and kind of that's where the book title came from the can you just sit with me you know it resonates with loss and grief but that title specifically came from a piece that I wrote in 2020 when all the racial violence was going on and people w weren't listening to this this is hurtful and even in like even in the church at the time um, I don't know, it makes me a little emotional, <laughs> but even during the church at the time, you know, they were like, you know, you know, kind of, you know, just get over it, let the past stay in the past. Um, it was just a hurtful time because people weren't listening to, you know, can you just, can you just sit with me? Like, this is hurtful. It was so, it was so weird to me to, that people would not be open to hearing the hurt of the black community. Wow. Yeah. Can you speak more about that title and that need, whatever the source of that need is, to have accompaniment when we're deeply hurting? whether it be through racial injustice or the death of a child or a sibling or the loss of a pregnancy, the power, like just when I say those words out loud, it's like I can feel the depth of the need, the emotional need beneath those words. Just it's, it's what the subtitles that I'm reading. It's like, understand my pain mm -hmm. try and really empathize I really need you to get this I really need you to see this I need to be understood I need to be witnessed mm -hmm. I'm sure there's more <laughs> will you tell me about those words and their importance to you mm -hmm. oh, just hearing you those are super super affirming because all those things that you just said exactly it's a really, really deep heart cry to say, you know, can you just sit with me? It's a, it's, it's so deep. Um, and it's because it's, it's not a, you know, when someone wants someone to sit with them or come alongside in those moments, we don't need to hear their story. Like, you know, um, we don't, we don't need someone to try to fix us or fix the problem or fix our loss you know um 
we need someone that can listen and listen well and just and just sit. Um, there's a quote that says, you know, what does someone who has has uh, experienced the worst loss that they've ever experienced, what do they need most, you know, um, for someone to say? And the answer is nothing. Because sometimes we can get get our words, you know, I don't want to say wrong, but we could say things that are un unhelpful. And so um, I think a lot of times we dismiss the power of our presence. Yeah. And just having someone here and near to us as we're sitting with our, our emotions and because it's okay to feel. And even how, you know, you had mentioned earlier with, um, um, loss orientation or the dual process model with oscillating back and forth. I mean, we have to feel to be able to kind of um, move through and, and move around. And so when we don't have that that space, make opportunity to do that, well, it, it, it makes a difference. It's like the loneliest of places to be on your own or or with people who aren't there they're there but they're not present yeah and what you're saying is so true just to have someone sit alongside but being fully present yes fully present just listening with their hearts rather than their ears yes and understanding there's nothing to be said here there's nothing to be changed there's nothing to be fixed. Just can I, you know, a hand and a back or a shoulder against a shoulder. Just I'm here. Yeah. I am just sitting with you. Yeah. It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. Did you have someone sit with you or was that a longing you had that wasn't, a, that wasn't met, a need that wasn't met? Mm -hmm. um, I can say for years. No, right. The answer is no, I did not. I didn't have a safe community. I didn't feel like I was safe to express my grief. I didn't feel like, to be honest, I didn't feel like anybody, anyone cared enough. And I had to get past that thought process um, just to be able to, in order to let myself begin to kind of express. And I found that a couple of years ago you know, in, um, in particular group at church. And it was a, it was a particular group that was called freedom, but it was, it's kind of funny that it comes to mind, but it was almost like an AA, but it wasn't an AA meeting. It was like, literally like, um, people expressing just some hard things that had happened to them, but there was such a freedom in expressing that it was so very, very healing. And I, I tell my pastors, I'm like, if I hadn't did that class or that group, I wouldn't have been able to write my book mm -hmm. because that was like the first safest place to be able to begin to express. And, um, and one thing I love to say as well is that my husband has learned over the years to sit with me and that has meant the world to me. And, and I say in learning, I mean, even um, I have this book, um, why, why Don't We Listen Better? Anyway, so he started to, to learn. He started to learn because I, I, feel, I feel like when we, when we care enough or we, we are come, want to come alongside people who are hurting, grieving, that we would take the time to, to learn. Absolutely. how to better support them and it's you know it's interesting that you're talking about your husband there and he's learned to come alongside and grieving styles is something I've learned about you know in the last few years that we don't all grieve the same way you know yeah. we tend to think that grieving is you sit and you cry and you feel emotional <laughs> but you know for some of us who are intuitive grievers yeah that's how we grieve and then for others and a lot of men are instrumental grievers. This is a problem. How do I fix it? 
Right. So what do I need to do? What needs to be attended to or changed or built or bought to make this okay again? Yeah. Um, so it's beautiful for somebody to go, well, my way isn't her way. So I have to learn her way. You know, it takes a lot of perception. You're lucky. <laughs> yeah, I'm, You're I'm so thankful. And boy, is he lucky as well. <laughs> wow. So your book, where is it available, Tasha? Yep. So can you just sit with me? It comes out um, September 26th, but it's available wherever books are sold. And we can put a link maybe in the description. Is it available for pre-order or it'll oh, just yes. be on Amazon? Yes. So it's available for pre-order now. Again, wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, just wherever books are sold, um, it's available for pre-order now. Okay. And um, can you just sit with me by Tasha Smith? I really look forward to reading that book. I haven't read it, um, but I know I might get a little advanced copy, which would be fantastic. There's yeah. something I wanted to say to you, actually, and ask you about, Tasha. You said, and I think it was when we were chatting beforehand, rather than when we were recording, that the depth of your grief really only became known to you when you started writing this book. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's so easy for us to assume, oh, yeah, someone had lots of losses years ago and they wrote written a book. Therefore, they're fine now. <laughs> and for anyone listening, Tasha's just sitting here shaking her head from side to side. And you're not the first person to have shared that with me. Um, I've had several people contact me and say, I've written a book or I've written a thesis about parental loss or, you know, bereavement overload. And I really, and they've written it from their head um, in a very cognitive manner. And once they start to talk about it, it's like they're, they're gripped with a different kind of grief, um, which isn't intellectual you know, it's, it's in the flesh, it's in the heart, it's, it's in the belly. Um, it's in the emotion and, and that surprises them. Because mm -hmm. they think they've processed it. What was your experience like researching the book and writing the book? You said you met your grief all over again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, especially like each chapter begins with um, some type of story of one, you know, a loss and just re kind of reliving those um, during that time frame would at the, at the time of writing was really for some of those losses, especially some of the older ones um, thinking through those for the first time since those time frames. And so that that was really hard. Like I cried a lot. <laughs> I, I was really emotional um, because I was literally reliving in some of the things that I had buried so deep. Hmm. I mean, so what that shows us as well as the power of writing, of journaling, yeah. um, to get in touch with some of those unprocessed losses you know, for anybody listening, I know in my own practice, sometimes I've had older people come along because and maybe an adult child has died or a spouse has died. And often what comes out is the baby that they gave up or the baby that died 40 years previously um, as an unprocessed loss. Yeah. You know, and it's never, never too late to go back and visit and talk about and think about or get support about yeah you said you went to counseling mm -hmm. yes um I love that you mentioned that because yeah um just the amount I, I want to say the amount of loss but really even if it's just one loss that you need support with go get it you know um but for me personally because of the amount of loss and just taking these last couple of years to begin to process, to begin to research and, um, and kind of begin to, 
you know, start a healing journey of, and really just deep dive into how did this make, you know, what was the loss? How did it make me feel, you know, and, and really sit in those feelings because it's okay to feel mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and just learning that was powerful for myself to, yeah. you know, that it's okay. I'm not crazy. <laughs> I, I just been through a lot. <laughs> yeah. And so, it's, yeah. It's, you know, you, you saying that it's okay to feel people actually need to hear that yeah. sometimes, you know, and th there's a lot of grief experts or specialists out there who say, well, however you grieve is your way and it's fine. And, and that's true. And, and with a little bit of learning and permission, we don't need to be so hard on ourselves as well. Um, and often when people come to me for grief counseling, you know, that they, they really need that permission to grieve mm -hmm. you know so however we're doing it isn't always the best way it's so you true know, sometimes we may we give ourselves a really hard time by trying to resist it or not giving us permission to have those feelings and those feelings can feel so overwhelming at the beginning yeah or for many people they feel if I take the lid off it now it's never going to stop it's too big I know I used to always feel that yeah. I was so scared to unscrew that that mm -hmm. lid on my emotional body because it genuinely felt like I was going to be a volcano that yeah. would erupt over everything and everyone yeah. but we don't really do that now in therapy it's not about get that <laughs> lid off and get it all out it's it's more about just gently releasing yeah. it letting a little bit out closing it again you know, exploring another bit, closing it again, and really gently bringing things to the surface, examining them, having feelings around them in a very unoverwhelming way, ideally. And we can be so much more gentle with therapy than people realize. Mm -hmm. But but rarely is it the big volcanic eruption right. that we think it's going to be. That's true. But I do find that that many, many people need permission. They come and they say, I can't stop crying. What's wrong with me? Or it's been eight months and I'm still crying. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, often I'll see people just for one session and say, that's completely normal. Right. Of course you're still crying. You, you haven't even begun really here, you know. Right, yeah. That's such a profound loss. Eight months is nothing after yeah. 30 years together or you know yeah and just painting the picture of what this might be like you know and 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 showing their experience is normal yeah hmm. I just wanted to say Tasha that I've been sort of off work for the last few weeks um well I haven't been seeing clients for about five weeks I'm on my summer vacation and I've been away caravanning and I've been doing administrative work stuff and I'm launching a new course online. So I've been very much like in my head or in fun and doing social things. Um, but tomorrow I actually start um, some research for my PhD and I'm going to be accompanying a group of people who've been bereaved on a six week forest therapy series and um, so I'm really excited about that. But the gift of our conversation today is that you've really brought me into my heart space, oh. having sort of left it for the last few weeks to go and live and do different things. You've really brought me right back into just that heart space and that compassion and that empathy. And I'm so glad that we spoke today in advance of me being with these groups, this group of people tomorrow, because it's like you've given me, you've brought me back into the zone that I've been out of for a few weeks. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. Thank you, Liz. I just, I've, I've totally just enjoyed just spending this time with you today. Yeah, it's been a gift and I really wish you the best with everything. Yes, thank you so much.